it is the great secret gap in our country, not just the wealth gap, it's the health treatment, mm -hmm. health prevention, health welfare gap. It's something that I'm gonna be on a major crusade about the next 10 years of my life because it's not fair. Insulin sensitivity can actually impact a woman's clitoris. The penis and the clitoris are the same from embryological development. It's the same tissues. So many people get it wrong when they say like, oh, you should be able to orgasm without stimulating the clitoris. But we all accept we stimulate a penis and it orgasms. Yeah. The same mechanism is true when it comes to what is happening with insulin and with our nerves. People don't even realize women get erections. Women can have an erection and be in pain if she doesn't achieve an orgasm in the same way that men can have that level of discomfort. What men are taught is that the way that you have sex is through penetration. And what women are taught is that sex equals a penis in the vagina. So everybody is being taught that that is the holy grail. In reality, what we know from the research is only about 18% of women orgasm from vaginal penetration alone, and that's based on their anatomy. Why the orgasm gap exists is not because of the rhetoric that men don't care about women's pleasure, they're just like in it for themselves, it's not that. It's that they haven't been educated. As a whole, our society really establishes when sex is had, there is one type of sex and that is the way to orgasm. And in reality, it doesn't line up to the research or most women's experiences. There is something no matter your sexual orientation that is universally true and that is communication. And so what should men know and what should women know? You have to talk. I just want everyone listening to understand if you feel like you've been left in the dark, that is on purpose. If you feel shameful about it, that's on purpose. So everything you're feeling is not a you problem, it's a major like clitoral conspiracy. Hey, it's Ed Mylad. I just wanted to thank you for being here, and I would ask you to please subscribe to the show. If you just click the subscribe button here, I would really appreciate it. It helps the show grow so we can get even more successful guests on the program to help you. At the same time, if you're subscribed, you're going to get access to the programs before anybody else in the world gets access to them. So if you would, click subscribe right here. Thanks so much. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the show. So grateful that you're all joining us today, but I'm really grateful that this lady is here. I pursued her to be here today. I saw some of her work on social media. A couple friends of mine know her, and I saw. I thought to myself, I need to have her on my show. And the more and more I've researched her, even preparing for this interview, I'm positive that I want her here today. And so I don't know what I would call Dr. Brighton other than, I guess I, she's she's a naturopathic but doctor, but I think she's like an expert on all things sex, health, hormones, women, wellness. And I wanted to do a show today. By the way, men, as you start to listen, this is for both men and women today, especially for you men that want to understand your woman, her body, her well-being much better. We're going to talk about that. And then for you ladies today, we're really going to go deep on a lot of things that relate to you both physically and emotionally and I have the perfect person here so Dr. Jolene Brighton thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me and that was such a nice introduction. <laughs> well, it's all true to be honest with you but I uh, and you know this I messaged you I said please come on my show. It took I know. us a while. I was Could getting texts for a while. Tell them why you had to tell them why you had to wait to come on. What was the reason? Oh, well because I'm going through IVF right. and so yeah you have to have everything timed of like when do you get eggs and then I was in Europe and yeah. speaking over there and I'm so glad we finally made it happen. I flew from Mexico City yesterday just for this interview. Oh my goodness. I'm honored that you did that. It, and, yeah, and there was a hurricane and I was like it's yeah. not stopping me. Oh my gosh, you're right. I didn't <laughs> yeah. even think about the timing of it. You're exactly right. <laughs> All right, let's get to the good stuff first. Guys, listen to this. Okay, you ready? For the ladies. You say women orgasm 65% of the time. Mm. Is that correct? Is that a correct quote? Yeah. Well, I don't say it. Research says it. Okay. Yeah, it's what's called the orgasm gap. Okay. And so there's a big discretion between how often a penis gets to ejaculate and how much a clitoris gets the stimulation that it needs to reach mm. orgasm. So men are orgasming about 95% of the time in a heterosexual relationship, and women is about 65% of the time. Why? Because of the clitoris and because yeah. of the lack of clitoracy, I should really say, which yeah. is uh, not my term. Uh, mm. Ian Kerner, he came up with that. Okay. Um, but I think it's brilliant. It's like literacy, but for the clit. And right. so what men are taught 
is that the way that you have sex is through penetration. And what women are taught, even in sex ed, is that sex equals a penis in the vagina. And so everybody's being taught that that is the holy grail. Uh, part of that is because of Freud, as I talk about in Is This you Normal? Do. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I slam him a little bit. Mm -hmm. Rightly so, because right. he was like, oh, the clitoral orgasm is so infantile. You want to strive for the vaginal orgasm. <laughs> but in reality, what we know from the research is only about 18% of women orgasm from vaginal penetration alone. Mm -hmm. And that's based on their anatomy, nothing that, that mm. they can control. And so why the orgasm gap exists is not because of the rhetoric that a lot of people fall into of like, men don't care about women's pleasure. Men, you know, they're just like in it for themselves. It's not that. It's that they haven't been educated. And as a whole, our society really establishes if you look at all media when sex is had there is one type of sex and that is the way to orgasm mm. and in reality it doesn't line up to the research or most women's experiences what do men need to know about a woman's clitoris that would benefit their woman and them and what do women need to know about that part of their body because yeah. i got to tell you that i i've had this discussion because i had another episode i did that we talked about this a little bit and i had so many messages from women telling me that even though it's their own body part mm -hmm. they were raised with very little understanding about it themselves and almost like taboo to like touch it or yeah. know how it works so what should a man know about a woman's clitoris that would benefit both him and her and what should she know yeah I love it that you shared that. I say in the book, if you listen to the audio, I'm not good at French, but membre en tout, that is what the clitoris was called by a French physician, mm. which means shameful member. So My the, gosh, are yes. you serious? Yeah, and we're talking like hundreds of years ago. So <laughs> this whole concept of feeling shame around that part of your body, so maybe you don't touch it yourself, you don't communicate about it. Mm -hmm. It's not just our modern society. The clitoris, as I call it, the clitoral conspiracy in the book, was taken out of medical literature. Mm. So we actually knew the clitoris was much larger than how it had been portrayed. But even today, most medical anatomy textbooks are not accurate. Mm. They're not showing accurate clitoral diagrams. And this is just mind-blowing, is that there's this statistic that's thrown out. And you'll hear like, oh, the clitoris has 8,000 nerve endings yeah. based on a cow. Research came out at the end of 2022, the first time we ever had a research on a human woman showing 10,000, maybe more. Mm. It needs to be replicated. But mm. I just want everyone listening to understand if you feel like you've been left in the dark, that is on purpose. Mm. If you feel shameful about it, that's on purpose. Mm. So everything you're feeling is not a you problem. It's a major like clitoral conspiracy. So <laughs> Clitoral conspiracy. <laughs> you know, I said man, woman, but I should ask you this I'm, out of curiosity. Is the data any different with orgasms with same sex uh, with a woman? It, a woman? Is. Yes. it is. Yes. So is it better? Uh, yes, it is. Of course it is. Because if you're a vulva owner, yeah. then yeah. you understand how a vulva works and where the anatomy mm. is. But there is something, no matter your you know sexual orientation, that is universally true. And that is communication. Mm. And so what should men know and what should women know? You have to talk. You have to talk in the bedroom about mm. what feels good, what doesn't feel good. I often say, don't don't go in with the negative of like, no, don't do that. But instead say, I really love enjoyed it when you did this or I was mm -hmm. loving this. So mm -hmm. in the book, I have three diagrams of the clitoris and one is it set in the vulva so that you can really see the mm -hmm. whole terrain and see where things are. Now, no two vulvas are the same much like fingerprints. So, it, you know, it's not going to be exactly like the diagram in the book. So you're going to have to ask questions. If you're not the vulva owner, ask questions. What we do know from the research is that predominantly women like moderate pressure. So not too hard, not too soft, very Goldilocks in all of yeah. this. Um, there needs to be a rhythm. So rather than, you know, this like up and down or poking or, uh, you know, going at it, uh, you know, offbeat, so to speak, mm -hmm. really finding a rhythm. So rhythmic circular motions, medium pressure, mm -hmm. that's going to do it for a lot of women, mm -hmm. stimulating the clitoris itself. But you need to ask because mm -hmm. maybe she likes more, maybe she likes less. And what's important to understand is that if she orgasms first it's more likely she's going to orgasm again mm. when there is penetration. So there is a lot, the men often come from this perspective of like, once I have an orgasm, I'm usually done. Once I ejaculate, 
I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm out. And they think like, well, if she has an orgasm, then she's done. It's over. And in Mm -hmm. fact, having an orgasm first, that can actually enhance the sexual experience going forward. So Mm -hmm. that if you want to try for penetrative orgasms, that's one of the tips that I give in the book. I also explain that there's no reason why you can't stimulate the clitoris at the same time and still achieve orgasm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to know if some things, how you would even measure this, or if it's just like, we'll call it a wives tale, though I don't like that terminology. And by the way, we're about to get to health and hormones and wellness, because it's connected to this as oh, well. Oh, absolutely. But I, is it true, I don't even know how you would measure this, but this is what I've always been told, that the reason a man is only orgasming once is that it's a much more intense experience for the man? Have you heard this before? And yeah. that the woman's orgasm is not quite as strong, and so that she has multiple ones. Is that completely not true? Is there, yeah, and that's how would you not, even measure it? I know. That's not true. Okay. That's another one of those, um, you know, we take a male body and then we compare women to it, but the male is always superior. And it's like, well, you can have multiples because your orgasms are not as good as mine. Got it. And in fact, when you ask experts, you blind them to the data of what people are reporting. An expert cannot tell the description of a man or a woman who is describing orgasm because they're so similar. They are similar. Yeah. But what it really is is a refractory period. It's just the ability for the nerves and the entire system to be able to fire again. To recover and Yeah. And once there is ejaculation. So to some extent, it means the woman's stronger in the sense that she can recover and and go again (laughs) compared to the man. I mean, (laughs) you know, there is something, uh, you know, as much as I'm a woman, I'd love to be like, oh, yes, we're stronger. (laughs) It's just different. Mm -hmm. And there are men who are able to achieve Mm -hmm. multiple orgasms. Mm -hmm. It just is not not necessarily the norm Mm -hmm. and is commonplace. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the same is true. There are women who are like, I can't achieve multiple orgasms. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Like the end of the day, are you having mutually beneficial pleasure that is consensual? Like winning. That's the winning. Okay. I love this. I love this. So we went to the, uh, salacious stuff first but we're going to come back to that i know you just so, were like let's just dive well, in let's i just, just get met to you it, right like come on <laughs> stuff i want to know like <laughs> this is my show damn it i want to understand how this stuff works and i'm 52 and finally learning this stuff it's a little late so um how is that no way no. there's actually research that shows that like senior citizens in some capacity are getting it on more than like, are you calling me a senior citizen this no i'm interview. just saying look at the road ahead <laughs> just kidding. you know it's funny totally off the record i got an email from the aarp this week so i'm really <laughs> sensitive to that topic i'm like what in the world they're prepping they're they're like... data on me already my gosh uh... i'm still interested in orgasms for gosh sakes okay so Women's health is connected to this topic, though. And so clitoral health. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you make a correlation. And by the way, correct me when I'm wrong, because I'm pretending to be a doctor here as we talk and and then talking about a body that I don't have. Well, you sound like someone who read my book. I am someone. By the way, I should basically say this, too. The book is called Is This Normal? Judgment-Free Straight Talk About Your Body. And I did read your book. And one of the things that I think I got there was that insulin sensitivity – can actually impact a woman's clitoris. I love that you're saying this. Okay, let's so talk about let's it. Talk okay, about so it. we have known for a very long time that if there is insulin sensitivity issues, so you're losing, uh, let me back this up. So if anyone doesn't know, mm-hmm. insulin comes from the pancreas. It basically knocks on the cell's door and is like, I vouch for glucose. They're cool. Let them in. So mm-hmm. That's what insulin does. When we lose sensitivity, when insulin goes to try to ring that doorbell, like the receptor is not receiving the message and the Mm. cell does not allow glucose in. And so what a lot of people will immediately think of as diabetes, but there's a spectrum before we get Mm -hmm. there. We lose the sensitivity to insulin before it becomes so bad that we are diagnosed with diabetes, which is when we no longer can control how much sugar stays in our bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Now, what we've understood for a very long time is that the penis will suffer damage from this. Now, that means nerve damage and blood vessel damage. And losing the ability to have an erection, sensation, this can happen when we have sensitivity to insulin issues and diabetes. Mm. Now, whenever I talk about this, people are like, I need to see extensive clitoral data. Here's what we know. One, there is studies out there showing decreased clitoral sensitivity because you have decreased blood flow and the nerves can become damaged when we have insulin dysregulation. Now, I want everybody to think back to biology and know that your biology teacher probably did you a disservice in not teaching you about the homologous structures. So the penis and the clitoris are the same 
from embryological development. It's the same tissues. Hmm. And so this is why if Freud just got it so wrong and so many people get it wrong when they say like, oh, you should be able to orgasm without stimulating the clitoris. But we all accept we stimulate a penis and it orgasms. Yeah. It's the same tissue. And so wow. the same mechanism is true when it comes to what is happening with insulin and with our nerves and with our entire cardiovascular system, but also just specific to the clitoris. The clitoris engorges in the same way mm. as the penis. And so people don't even realize women get erections. Women uh, can have an erection and be in pain if there is, like, she doesn't achieve an orgasm in the same way that men can have that level of discomfort. Now, let me just say, in saying that, that is no reason to forego consent or for anybody to be coerced or pressured into sex. Sure. But when I start to explain that, women are like, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. Like, the aching that I had or, you know, the, the mm. fact that I thought Things change down there, and they do. This is so good. I, I didn't know that. I Most people know, don't. You know, I, I did not know that. So one of the things that I've always wondered why it doesn't happen more is why couples don't work out together more. Like, mm-hmm. they both might work out, but they don't do it together. Yeah. And to me, like, I'll give you two things, and but one of them is your thing. So, uh, like, it's hot. Yeah. It's hot to watch your partner, like, train and work out mm-hmm. and exert their body and they got usually less clothes on or skimpier clothes like it's a hot thing i would think more couples would do it it's yeah. interesting like sometimes only one of the two actually work out but rarely do they work out together mm-hmm. it's almost like i'm on this side of the gym you're on the other because the maybe the weight discrepancy or the things you're working on but even like going to the gym together yeah and then leaving together i think is a hot thing right that's number one but number two there's a correlation between weight lifting mm-hmm and some of these uh, insulin sensitivity issues as well, right? So there's yeah. actual clitoral and penal health yeah, absolutely. to actually lifting weights. Yeah. If you want to have good sex, you want to build muscle mass. And that's because muscle mass helps keep us sensitive to insulin. It's also going to help with your hormones overall. Mm. So no matter if you were given ovaries or testes at birth, your hormones will be better if you build muscle mass. So there's okay. the insulin component, but there's also the fact that that's going to help with testosterone production mm-hmm. and testosterone levels. And mm. this is often where People will say like, oh, well, women don't need testosterone like men do. Mm -hmm. False. In fact, we do need testosterone. And both of us get similar symptoms when our testosterone is too low. It's Mm -hmm. not just low libido. And in fact, it's rarely that I ever see somebody that struggles with their libido that it's just a testosterone issue. Mm -hmm. If you're seeing a testosterone issue, as I go through in the book, I actually do it as a checklist so that people can... Mm -hmm evaluate themselves, you see low mood, lack of motivation. So maybe you don't want to go to the gym anymore. And that's like, that's just like so hard, right? Because you need to build the muscle mass to have the testosterone, but the testosterone is too low. You're not building the muscle mass. So you could be losing muscle mass. You can find that you're easy to cry. This can happen in men or women. Mm. Waking up, Feeling tired and that fatigue just lasts all day. Mm. We have to rule out other things, like could it be thyroid? But these are some of the ways that testosterone can show up. Mm. And what is, I think, really another thing that's problematic and puts a lot of pressure on men as well is that we still have the stigma about showing emotions. And so... Mm. They may be stifling emotions, thinking, like, I'm feeling depressed, but I don't, I don't, I'm not going to talk about this. Like, I'm a man, and, like, yeah, I want to cry, but, like, that's weird, right? Mm. And really, that can be a sign of your hormones being an issue. Really good. By the way, you're extraordinary. <laughs> like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, like, so riveted and engaged in this conversation for me right now. I want to ask you something that I wasn't planning on asking you, but it just came up. So the sensitivity issue. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to talk as a guy for a second. But you said our 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 um, the clitoris and the penis are made of the same tissue. So I'm mm-hmm. curious about it. my male friends that get into their late 30s, 40s, 50s, like myself. There's a lot of talk about um, you know erectile dysfunction or mm-hmm. things like that. I don't find that that's the n- conversation that I have with most of my male friends. Um, maybe it's a taboo conversation, but when we're really being candid with one another. The conversation isn't that they're not getting as erect. The, the the sex issue for men that I know is the sensitivity issue, mm-hmm. meaning the erection itself may be pretty similar to what it used to be, but it just doesn't feel as good as it used to, yeah. if I'm being blunt. So is that also true for a woman as she gets older? And, mm-hmm. and aside from insulin sensitivity, is there something you can do 
in your diet, your hormone supplementation, some other external oil, cream, something you do that increases sensitivity for both a male and a female? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So when we talk about sensitivity, we're talking about nerves. Mm -hmm. And so it, for anybody who experiences a change like that, meeting with a urologist and just getting checked out and worked on. Okay. That is like the first thing I would say. Okay. If you are ever, you know, coasting through life and then something changes, that's a sign to see a doctor. Okay. Usually people are waiting for like, oh, I have erectile dysfunction or I'm just disinterested in sex altogether. They're waiting for more of the extremes to justify going to the doctor. But really what we're looking for is what was your normal and has it changed? Okay. And if it changes, then we're interested in that. So okay. when it comes to de decreased sensitivity, yes, that can be hormone related. Okay. And um, so in men, it certainly can be related to testosterone. So insulin aside, it can be related to testosterone. In women, we find, especially in the late perimenopause, moving into menopause, as estrogen declines, we can get clitoral atrophy. So the clitoris can actually shrink because mm. of the lack of estrogen mm. stimulation. Same with the vaginal tissue itself. It can become very thin. It can become dry. Sex can become painful and unenjoyable. So mm. hormones can be related to the decrease in sensitivity. And I actually thought like maybe we're starting to talk about how you know, there can sometimes be performance anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, this is something, uh, so I talk about this research, the dual control model from Bancroft and Jansen in my book. And it basically simplifies to like a gas pedal and a brake, like the things that turn you on, the things that make you go, and the mm -hmm. things that like shut it down mm -hmm. or derail your train, so to speak, from mm -hmm. receiving any messages of mm -hmm. sexual stimuli. And whenever I talk about this research and I talk about it from the perspective of women, I always get comments online where men are like, well, this happens to me too, and this doesn't take into account my experience. And I'm like, no, no, no. The research was first done on men, and then they were like, we should probably think about women in mm. this as well. Mm. So when I – in this model, you know, what society tells us is like – you know, Hallmark, you know, get the card, get the flowers, get the chocolate, uh, turn on the sexy mu music, get the scented candles. Those are all the positive input, the gas pedal. In reality, the uncomfortable place where we actually need to work is on all the breaks. So we can have body image issues. Like it doesn't matter what your gender is. You can mm -hmm. feel insecure about your body, about being naked, about uh, what does your body look like in this position? And so mm -hmm. You know, the first of like, what does your body look like can make it so that you never even feel like you can get in the mood. And the other aspect of like worrying about what your body looks like in a position can actually pull you out of the mood once you get going. And mm. so there's all these psychological factors and stressors that come into play mm. for women. It's usually not feeling tended to, not feeling supported, safe, taken care of in a relationship. And because they're so sensitive to the environment, they can definitely have the hormonal component as well. So hormones can be a blockade. Mm. And so the way to really think about this I, is, is through there's an intake form um, that we use as a certified sex counselor. There's an intake form to understand how sensitive the gas pedal and brake is. But the really the thing to understand is it doesn't matter if you have more gas, like you're easy to go or if you have like, you know, a lot of breaks, like in terms of being good or bad. Mm -hmm. It just is. Mm -hmm. And it's like who you are in your makeup. Mm -hmm. And so the thing to understand is like what will actually block you from getting in the mood and identify those things and work on those things. Some are going to be a you issue. Some is going to be a them issue. Some is going to be an us issue. Mm -hmm. And you can work on those things to really achieve the pleasure and the sex that you desire okay. with the understanding as well that while all of society, again, we go back to media, like anytime we see sex in the media, right, in a movie, it's always like, oh, like he looked at her and like they were kissing and she just orgasmed and everybody just wants to have sex. And it can feel that way at the beginning of a relationship. But that classical picture of spontaneous desire is not everybody's true mm. state. So spontaneous desire is like, I'm going to sex on the brain. I think about it more uh, often than someone who has responsive desire. With the spontaneous desire, women can feel that, like around ovulation, as I talk about in the book, mm -hmm. where they're like, why am I in the yeah. grocery? Right. And like this song came on and that's doing it for me. Or right. I'm looking at this magazine and I'm like, yes, like mm -hmm. I need I need to go home. Like, right, I, right, right. And that's that more spontaneous desire. Responsive, totally normal as well. 
that is something where you really have to get things going before things get going. Mm -hmm. And men and women can both have this alike. Mm -hmm. But because society really puts all of these stereotypes in place and is like, men should be the pursuer, men should be this way. If you're not that way, you feel like something's wrong with you. And then if you are opposite, you're a woman and you're like, I'm the pursuer. Mm -hmm. I'm the one always interested. Then that's when we see headlines like, you know, when Megan Fox was talking about how she wants to have sex all the time. And then, you know, the media is like, oh, she's like a teenage boy and she's like a man. And I'm like, no, she's just her. Like, and that's her. her normal. Yeah. So good that you just said that. Uh, let's shift a little bit now to health because yeah. it's connected to this. So now we're going to go into a little bit less sex, a little bit more health. Um, I want to go through some of the hormone stuff with you mm-hmm. um, that you talk about in the book. I also want them to get the book, so I don't want to cover all of it. But I want to go through a couple primary ones with you. What are some of the signs that you're having adrenal issues? Mm. And then what can you do about them? Because I've addressed mine. And man, yeah. d- at least for me, I must say... That it was one of those boxes. I knew I, I take testosterone, so mm-hmm. I kind of knew what my testosterone was. I know what my estrogen is. I get my you know um, my cholesterol checked. I have these other markers. I know what my liver enzymes are. I have these other things. Mm-hmm. I wasn't really looking at my adrenals, and I just I I with what my testosterone levels were, I should have had more energy in mm-hmm. my case. And I was finding myself like like around two o'clock, like I think I need a nappy poo right yeah. here. Like what is going on with me right now? So let's talk adrenals for a minute. Yeah. So if people don't know what the adrenals are, we should start there. They're two little glands. They sit on top of your kidneys and they release several hormones. So cortisol is one. Uh, We also have aldosterone, which is going to govern your blood pressure. That's why we can sometimes see lightheadedness. So if you Mm -hmm. stand up, you get really dizzy. Mm -hmm. You have low blood pressure. Mm -hmm. That can be related to the adrenal glands. And then they also release the fight or flight hormones. So epinephrine, norepinephrine. And then a big one that we all should be fans of, which is DHEA. And DHEA is an anti-aging hormone that starts its decline at 25, which I just think is super lame (laughs) because we need it, especially as women, so much as we get into menopause. And it's a precursor to estrogen and testosterone. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of the ways that we make those hormones. Contrary to popular belief, the ovaries and the testes are not the only sources of estrogen and testosterone. So the adrenal glands are important in that as well. Mm. So when you talk about that afternoon fatigue, cortisol should spike first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. This is why I tell people, open up your curtains, expose yourself to light. Even if you can't see the sun, trust me, every dermatologist is telling you to put on sunscreen because the UV rays still get through. Mm -hmm. Yet that's going to help degrade melatonin and support you in spiking your cortisol first thing in the morning, as you should. Now, as cortisol goes through the day with you, it's going to decline and it should be at the lowest in the evening. However, in some people, Mm -hmm. what we'll see is that instead maybe they're spiking at 10 a.m., And they're having tremendous anxiety at work. And it's correlating to like that really stressful drive they took going in, having a meeting every Monday morning. And like we're we're seeing this like pattern of stress that's causing a spike in cortisol. And then they later plummet in other people. And what some people will call adrenal fatigue, it's, you know, a a common thing for people to say. And I don't ever like to finger wag at Mm -hmm. like layperson terms, but your adrenals are not tired. What is actually happening is we have HPA dysregulation. So the H and the P are in the brain and the A is the adrenal gland. So it's the way the brain and the adrenal glands are talking. Mm -hmm. And with that, sometimes what we can see is what I call a reverse cortisol curve. And this is really common in parents whose infants have literally trained them to stay up. Like People Mm -hmm. are like, I will sleep train my baby. I'm like, why? Watch them sleep train you, friend. (laughs) So instead of spiking in the morning, they're spiking in the evening. And so they're wired and tired. They're so fatigued. Their body's tired, but their brain just can't. Yes. Get, it can't stop. They wake in the morning. They have headaches. They're feeling so tired. They're the people that are like, they have the coffee bugs. It's like, don't talk to me until mm-hmm. coffee. You know, all of those. Anytime I see that, I'm like, check your adrenals, friend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> check your adrenals. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's some of the things that we can see going on. What can you do for your adrenals if they are not functioning correctly? Yeah. So we always want to know why, like what's okay. going on. So there are is the more extreme case of Addison's disease. So when people say adrenal fatigue, I'm like, that's adrenal fatigue. Because in Addison's, that's an autoimmune condition. It's rare. 
uh, President Kennedy actually had it. Yeah. So he had that um, darkening of his skin. You have to be on hormone replacement therapy uh, eventually for those adrenal glands. And you can have like Adazonian crisis, which is you're going to be hospitalized. It's life threatening. So that is more of the extreme. But for most people, it's going to be chronic stress nonstop. That can be psychological stress. It could be infections, people living in their house with mold. Like it can come up a lot of ways. And so we have to identify what the stressors are and try to mitigate those, remove them. It's not so easy. You know, I'll see colleagues who are like, you know, I tell people they need to quit their job. And I'm like, well, people need to make money. Yeah. That's the society we live in. Right, so, right. and to me, it's like there is. Well, there are situations where we have tremendous stress that is relentless that we do need to get out of. But a lot of the times it's how people are managing their stress. Mm. So what's interesting is that we look at things like mind body medicine. So uh, doing meditation, deep breathing, mm -hmm. uh, going for walks, all these things that, you know, so people were sometimes like, oh, you know, whatever, that mamsy pamsy stuff. Not only is it so good for your stress, it builds resiliency. It actually makes you stronger in the in the face of stress and able to recover faster. Mm -hmm. And we also know that not only is it associated with lower uh, depression, anxiety, but also like hot flashes, night sweats, things mm -hmm. that happen in menopause. These mind body practices can have a tremendous benefit. So mm -hmm. there's the mind body. There's how we manage our stress, but there's also our nutrition. And you know, I'm a nutrition scientist, so yes. I'm always about like, how do we eat in a way to optimize? Our adrenal glands are one of the most concentrated tissues with vitamin C in our body. Mm. So they need a lot of vitamin C. Okay. And so with that, you can be eating things like bell peppers. So usually people go to citrus fruit. I'm a big fan of like start the morning with like some lemon juice and some mm. salt in it. So you're getting electrolytes. Mm. Uh, electrolyte balance in the body is really important for adrenal health as well. But so you're just enhancing your vitamin C. But bell peppers are actually an excellent mm. source. Peppers in general. Eat Mexican food, everybody. <laughs> Get your peppers. So getting vitamin C. Vitamin B5, uh, mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms are actually an excellent source of that. Good. And looking at, you know, how can you manage your blood sugar throughout the day? Not from the like, how am I managing my insulin and getting like super, um, you know, <laughs> like myopic on it. But instead looking at like, how am I starting my day? Most people are going to do best to have high protein in the morning and bring in fiber as well. Mm -hmm. So for men, we want to get about 30 grams of fiber a day and women about 25 grams of fiber a day. And for most people, we're going to want to hit at least 30 grams, like 25, 30 grams of protein in the morning. More if you're lifting weights, more if you have a larger body. And mm -hmm. the reason for that is because the, you know, we used to do this calculation of like you need you know, 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight of protein, that is too low. And we've known it's too low for a very long time. Wow, people, and, most people are getting so much less than that, too. I know. And yeah. you'll hear a lot of people argue like, oh, there's we don't need protein, right. that much protein. And I, I'm like, you know, my back when I was doing nutrition research, it was on sarcopenic obesity, which is the loss of muscle mass, the infiltration of fat and the risk of cardiometabolic events of, you know, diabetes, of having a heart attack, having strokes, like the, all of this goes up. Having a fall and breaking your bones, like mm. losing your ability to walk on your own in life, like mm. this all goes up. And so if people are like, well, you know, what does that look like? I say, you know, think about the round M&M, the round M&M guy. You have skinny arms and skinny legs and this big round body. And what's happening is we're getting fat infiltration around the organs. Oof. So visceral adiposity. Mm. That is the worst. <laughs> like mm. We don't want it. I'm always like, look, you got a booty and thighs. I don't care. Keep your fat there. Yeah. It's around your organs. We've got a problem. Okay, so good. Speaking of that, uh, progesterone. Mm -hmm. So everyone talks about testosterone and estrogen nowadays, which we, we'll address it in a second. But this is one of those that you write a lot about and talk a lot about, too that I never hear about, to be honest with you. So yeah. do, address that topic for a second, because I think this is one of these things. People listen to a lot of podcasts. They may hear something. I don't think they've probably heard it this way before. So Yeah, well, let's let's live up to that. Okay, okay yeah. so the only way to progesterone is via ovulation. And so the ovaries make progesterone via a temporary endocrine structure known as the corpus luteum. So once an egg gets released, there's a little structure left behind that produces progesterone. 
So if you're not ovulating regularly, like perimenopause, mm-hmm. PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, or for another reason, you're not making progesterone regularly. Okay. Now, progesterone becomes the main hormone of your luteal phase. So in the menstrual cycle, we start our period, that kicks off the follicular phase, and estrogen is in charge. Estrogen's going to rise along with testosterone. They're going to spike around ovulation. This is why you're going to want to have sex more. You think about sex more, estrogen, testosterone. Once you ovulate, here comes progesterone. And progesterone should take the lead over estrogen. Estrogen should still be present, but now progesterone is finishing up getting the endometrium, the lining of the uterus, ready for pregnancy, potential pregnancy. Your body's always like, let's get knocked up, whether you want to or not. But it's also really nourishing for the brain. It helps with anxiety. So we know that when progesterone is low, we can feel more anxious. That's because of how it interacts with the GABA in our brain. So the GABA receptor, that is going to dock GABA, which is a chill out neurotransmitter. So mm. non excitable time. And that's really lovely so that we can get good, nourishing, restorative sleep. And so um, progesterone's also been shown to be uh, helpful in building the myelin sheath. Those are how nerves are conducting mm-hmm. all the messages, how I'm talking to you right mm-hmm. now. And it's also involved in cardiovascular health, in bone health. It does a lot in the mm-hmm. body. It, I'm just sitting here listening to you thinking, what an amazing time we're in. I know, that right? we know these things about ourselves now that really most people were unaware of. Ten, even 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. The other thing that's become more common, I told you that I take it, is hormone replacement therapy. Mm-hmm. I wonder, and it's okay if you don't like it, but I'm wondering how you feel about that. And is there an appropriate age, an appropriate reading level? A, your, a testosterone level drops below a certain amount? Mm-hmm. Or, or do you believe you can cure all of that, I guess, naturally, nutritionally? Oh, I wish. Um, The thing about the ovaries is when they're done, they're done. And we know that also men's testosterone declines as they age Mm -hmm. as well. And what, you know, people need to understand about this is that for a long time, you know, people have touted like, you know, it's a natural process, like you should let it happen. But we're living so much longer. Right. So it's like one thing when you went through menopause at 51, which is the average age, and then you passed away at 60 something. Mm-hmm. But now if you're living to 80 something, that's a long time to live. Mm-hmm. And when we lose these hormones, our brain becomes impacted. So we see increased risk of dementia. Our cardiovascular system gets impacted. So, you know, to your question about when do we start it, as close to menopause as possible. Mm-hmm. With perimenopause, we will not necessarily start like estrogen early on. It may be progesterone that we're bringing And the reason for that is because once you stop ovulating, which is what's happening in perimenopause, it becomes more irregular. And once you're done and it's been 12 months, now you're in menopause, which is where everybody focuses is like, let's focus on menopause, this one day event. And then we're post-menopause. But I'm like, there's this 10 years, you know, seven to 10 years before menopause where you might be struggling. So progesterone being the first to go is one of the first things that we usually look at bringing in. And then bringing in estrogen in that later phase of perimenopause before you're transitioning into menopause and then continuing it. If we do that, there's some research saying that estrogen replacement therapy is performing better than these lipid drugs in women when it comes to cardiovascular health. If we do that closer to menopause, then we are seeing benefits in terms of possibly preventing dementia. So there's a lot of benefit to bringing these in. Mm. And I think it's really important for people to understand because there's been a couple of large studies. We actually, I think we used um, hormone replacement therapy for almost like 60 years before they started to do, they decided to do a randomized control trial. And I know it's a long time, right? (laughs) And then they did it. But, you know, there was a couple of studies and they just weren't great because Mm. one of the studies, they were basically taking you know, more advanced age than what we would start and who already had cardiovascular issues and then showed that like, yeah, they had stroke, they had heart attack because this isn't a treatment. It's a prevention. Mm. We have to come in earlier. Another study, mm. they wanted asymptomatic women because otherwise they would know they were in the trial if they got better. They'd mm. be like, oh, I'm definitely getting the real thing. No yeah. placebo here. Um, so, you know, this is not who we typically use it with. There's usually symptoms and that's why we start using it and looking into it. The other thing is that they had smokers in the group and other people in the group who 
already were at higher risk. But the problem with these studies is that the women were beyond where we would start somebody on hormone replacement therapy. They had already been without hormones for, you know, a decade or more. Mm. And so I think it's really important to understand that a lot of recommendations have been based on research that doesn't correlate with how we actually do hormone replacement therapy. Mm. I am a fan because I would like my patients to all remember a well-lived life and not end up with dementia Mm -hmm. to have a strong pelvic floor and urinary tract symptom to where Mm -hmm. they don't develop urinary incontinence is one Mm -hmm. of the primary reasons women go into nursing homes Mm -hmm. Uh, to be able to not have vaginal dryness to be able to enjoy sex is there a correlation one of my next questions yeah yeah correlation between hormone levels and and um, lubrication and oh, yeah. vagina. There is. Okay. Yeah. Because so, I've had other people tell me they didn't think there was. So there is. Oh, yeah. That would um, be lovely, right? If that didn't work yeah. that way. So let me like back it up and say this. So there is a phenomenon known as arousal non concordance. What that is, is it doesn't matter how in the mood you are sure. or your hormones or anything. Your genitals are not getting the memo mm-hmm. and they're just not lubricating. Also, it depends on where you're at in your cycle. So this is how we know that it is correlated with hormones is because if you're about to ovulate, estrogen is up, you are going to notice that it's easier to Mm self-lubricate. If you are in the later phase of your cycle, that late luteal phase and progesterone is up, it's going to be more difficult to self-lubricate. So, But at no point is lube ever a bad idea. I actually say in the book that a lube-free bedroom is a place where good sex goes to die. Yeah, you do say that. Yeah, so um, with that, we also know that's one of the signs and symptoms of being postmenopausal and having low estrogen is the vaginal dryness. So. And we're not talking just like, oh, I have difficulty self-lubricating with sex. We're talking about things can get so dry that wiping with tissue paper, you can you know Mm. just go to the bathroom and you bleed. Mm. Or that it's dry and the tissue's sticking together. I've had patients that are like, it feels like I'm walking there's sandpaper in my vagina. It's a horrible feeling. Mm. But the other thing about estrogen that often goes overlooked is that estrogen helps with the cells creating glycogen, which is a sugar that feeds the lactobacilli species. They're who keep the pH down so that we do not get infections as regularly. And so it's also really important for vaginal ecology. Okay, really good. So by the way, in a minute, we're going to ask a question for someone younger. So okay. stick with me. But <laughs> one thing for, and I'm not a doctor, obviously, listening to you talk, I proved I should have never gone to medical school. Um, but I'm 52, and at my age, when I meet people near my age, 10 years younger, 10 years older, I can almost immediately tell whether they're on hormone replacement therapy. Mm-hmm. And I feel this, and I mean this the right way, I almost feel some form of sadness for those that have not at least investigated and pursued it because I'm, I, you're aging right before my eyes mm-hmm. to an extent that maybe isn't necessary. Yeah. And I have friends of mine that are in their 70s that when I take a just visually look at them or their vitality or their mm-hmm. strength or how active I know they are sexually and physically compared to other friends of mine that are even 10 years younger. Yeah. But from a hormonal perspective, the 60-year-old is much older than the 70-year-old. And I'm thinking that this stuff isn't even very expensive, some mm-hmm. of it. And by the way, I'm not carte blanche recommending it. For example, my testosterone impacts negatively my HDL, which mm-hmm. is already genetically very low so i have to be careful there's no across the board recommendations here like you got to know what it's doing to your body and get your labs drawn regularly but one thing that's remarkable to me is you take my audience that's all these folks that are really trying to live a better life Mm -hmm. they're working on their minds they're working on their fitness and their body they eat clean yet they almost never get their labs done yeah they never look at their body and their (laughs) i'm such a data junkie i'm always tracking i I just went and got um my full mri body scan this morning with pronovo you did you did it i do one once a year as myself oh that's amazing and and, uh, peter diamantis was sitting here four hours ago doing a conversation we were talking about that very thing like yeah now some of these things I feel sometimes frustrated to discuss because some of them are more expensive and oh, some yeah. folks listening can't afford it. But a lot of these things like getting your blood drawn, usually if you have insurance even, mm-hmm. that's going to be covered. And so just this is how you'll know. You can't tell from on the outside of your body. Yeah. You know, getting these things looked at. Let's talk about something for someone a little bit younger. And it's the topic that you talk a lot about on your social media, which, by the way, you should be following her there, too. But also I want to know the impact of taking the pill if mm-hmm. you're a woman. 
What what's your overall belief about taking the pill? What should somebody know a about taking it and when they're on it? What's happening in their body, and what potentially happens when you get off of the pill and that impact? Okay, this is a big question. So if I miss any of it, you just let me know. All right. I, I wrote I don't, a, I, knowing you, I don't think you're gonna miss any. Of it. I wrote okay. a whole book on okay. um, the topic. So you know, firstly, you want to say that the pill has a necessary place in women's health. And I think there's a lot of people who are like, it's just a pregnancy prevention drug. Mm -hmm. And then they think like, oh, you could just, you know, do all these other methods. And the reality is, is that there is no one size fits all for contraceptives or for pregnancy prevention. We have to counsel the patient. Mm -hmm. Same as like hormone replacement therapy, although this is not the same uh, because hormone replacement therapy has more benefits than necessarily the pill does for some people. So it just depends, right? So the first thing I'll say is that we do need access to the pill, IUDs, the whole works. It, yeah. Barriers, yes, especially if you're in a non-monogamous relationship, barriers should be on point. But the pill has utility in terms of somebody, as you were just saying, like not everybody can afford screening labs. Not everybody can afford the treatments available. It's unfortunate. I really wish that we lived in a society that gave everybody access it's to so frustrating things. to me that one topic, not to interrupt you, but the yeah. disparity in health care yeah. between those that can afford it and those that can't. It is it is the great secret gap in our country, not just the wealth gap. It's the health treatment, mm-hmm. health prevention, health welfare gap. Is just, it's it's something that I'm going to be on a major crusade about the next 10 years of my life because it's not fair yeah. that somebody with a little bit more means can get full body MRIs and their labs done and afford hormone replacement therapy yeah. and talk to somebody. That's why podcasts are so great. I can put the world's best expert on this in front of anybody who's on any budget can listen to this right now. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, you're totally to fine. No, this is a conversation. That's how those go. <laughs> it's totally cool. So, um, you know, what I was saying though, so let's say somebody has polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, me in a perfect world would prefer that we are working on diet and lifestyle and like we can get everything dialed in but maybe they don't have the budget they don't have the means like there is something that's a barrier and they're not ovulating regularly they're going to be at risk of endometrial hyperplasia if they're not getting their period that is where the lining of the uterus builds up Mm. and after years of that they're going to be at risk of endometrial cancer So I can prevent cancer in someone by giving them the pill until maybe their life situation changes or they can, you know, adopt adopt a lifestyle, you know, that would help them with PCOS. By the way, for everyone listening, the new recommendations just came out. The international recommendations say that everybody should have lifestyle and nutrition as first line therapies. It should be Mm -hmm. part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So it is important. It does have utility. Well, not everyone can do that. Not everybody lives in a safe environment. So I did two years of clinical rotations in a homeless youth shelter. These are women who don't have doors to lock. These are women who cannot protect themselves. Mm. And an unintended pregnancy would be detrimental mm. to their life. And so um, I just say that because I am going to say some negative things about right. the pill. Because, you know, I think that we have to weigh the pros and cons for everybody. But we also have to recognize that there has been utility for the pill and that utility still exists. And while I would love us not to just treat symptoms without looking into it, not everybody can look into why we have symptoms. So that's the first thing I'd say to know about the pill. If you have irregular periods, if you are finding you have painful periods, if you have acne, if you have symptoms that your doctor throws into the bucket of lady part problems, and the first thing they pass you is the pill, pause because that's going to mask whatever is going on we can't test your hormones at that point we can't you know there's things that we can't do to work you up to understand what was actually the cause here and why that's problematic is because we already have conditions like endometriosis and pcos that are underdiagnosed that leave women to suffer that have consequences like infertility that they don't even know about Mm. because they're just past the pill or they're ignored by healthcare. so that is one piece The other piece is to know that just because your doctor may tell you like, oh, the side effects are so minimal, don't worry about it, they don't discuss you with it, or they dismiss you, that whatever you're experiencing is true. And that, I think, is the biggest problem. Women are past the pill, and then they're gaslit about their experience. And What do you mean by that? So you go on the pill. Mm -hmm. You find that maybe you are 
part of the that population that has adverse mood effects. Yeah. And you're told, oh no, it couldn't be the pill. It's yeah. just you. Your yeah. life changed. Like you're like you have a chemical imbalance. Yeah, yeah you introduced chemicals in my system. Right. And then I became depressed. And so it can be something like that with mood. Yeah. Um, noticing weight gain. So mm-hmm. from the studies, we're like, mm, it doesn't really cause weight gain when you look at the average. You're not always going to be the average. We expect in statistics that when we have a bell curve, there will be these outliers. We expect that. And yet when doctors prescribe treatments or, you know, especially in the case of like the pill, they're so quick to be like, no, the research doesn't show it. Right. Therefore, you're, right. what you're feeling and experiencing is not true. Right. And this is why I tell people. If you're going to start the pill, write down your data. What what's your mood like? What are like just go through everything, and then you can track it because a doctor will always successfully gaslight you if you do not have things written down and you do not have that right in front of you. Because, and I shouldn't say always. Some of you will be very good at this, but what I say is that when you write down your data, your doctor starts to gaslight you about things. I'm like, this for my Star Wars fans out there, you literally look at it and you Obi-Wan Kenobi them. You're like, these are not the droids you seek. Like you are not going to basically (laughs) mess with my mind right now because a lot of times doctors will be like, you're misremembering. No, no other woman has this. I've never had a patient experience. You start to doubt yourself. So Hmm. track your data so you can know what is true for you and what's not true for you. Okay, I'm really glad you talk about this because, again, I'm – I want to categorize myself clearly again. I'm a layman, but I have a daughter and we don't give millions of young men a chemical in their body Mm -hmm. when they turn 16 or 18 or 19 or 20 years old. But let's just be real. There are millions and millions of young girls in the world today that are prescribed that pill so their parents can sleep better at night. Mm -hmm. And and there's also been a mental health crisis amongst our young people for a very long time. And I have to wonder whether in some cases there's correlation there. And if you have a young daughter or if you're a woman in general, this is a place to at least evaluate whether or not it's making an impact on you. Because I can tell you, in my in my sense, if it was reversed and we had millions of young men that were being prescribed medication young in their life. And by the way, and as you said, plenty of reasons to be prescribed may be okay for most people, but it's not even one of the places that we're looking to see if it's affecting brain fog, mental health mm-hmm. issues, weight gain. Could the weight gain be connected to the mental health issues? And yeah. All these things in general. So I'm so glad that you discussed this. And everybody listening to this, that that if you are a young person or you are you have a daughter, just this is something to at least evaluate and to wonder. And the, you're right. Like I have had friends all of my life say, I felt different when I took it. The doctor mm-hmm. told me that's not reported. The doctor told me that that's not one of the causes. And so you are introducing a chemical to your body. It's going to do something somewhere, somehow, yeah. right? So Well, I have to share with you that, um, so for IVF, and people, this is on my YouTube, if you're like, have more questions about all the details, I put mm-hmm. it in, I, I share about my life. But um, I needed to start the pill and only be on it for 10 days because there was a whole timing issue of like, you know, when you're going to Europe and this and that, and like life was just crazy. And so I had to be on it only 10 days, only a few days in, my mood tanked Mm. and was bad and not only was I feeling ragey but I was like crying and feeling depressed and Mm. I started to gaslight myself like this can't happen this quickly no there's no way like it's because you wrote a book about it and you're just like tricking yourself I and my husband's like dude you have to get off that pill like you are not yourself Mm. and I'm like okay it's not just me and I bring that up because that was a short period of time I also started to break out with cystic acne. Mm -hmm. And you are looking at me now, everybody. My skin is clear. Mm -hmm. And this is something that my doctors also were like, when I had um, come off the pill, I got cystic acne. I started having issues. They were like, no, it's not the pill. It can't be the pill. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, but like, that's the thing that changed. So... Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes to teens, I am like right there with you. Like that is such, like I have boys right now. Um, I also, you know, if they end up in a heterosexual relationship, I don't want anybody's life being hijacked by an unplanned pregnancy Mm -hmm. as a teen. And, um, for everybody who's like abstinence only read Mm -hmm. the book, Uh, I talk Mm -hmm. about the research Mm -hmm. (laughs) and Mm -hmm. what Amsterdam and Mm -hmm. Germany have done differently and how they have such vastly better outcomes. So But I digress. Okay, so let me go back to teens. Um, They are at higher risk for not only depression, but also suicide. Mm -hmm. 
So that makes you be like, oh my God, maybe I shouldn't, they shouldn't take the pill. You can change formulations and that can change people night and day. So this is important to understand is that just because one pill doesn't work for you doesn't mean another pill won't. And what I tell parents and what I tell patients is monitor. With teens, it's hard. They don't always want to talk to their parents. So Mm -hmm. their bestie needs to be dialed in. I start dodging your texts. I'm not interested in the things I used to. I'm not showing up to like my dance practice, gymnastics, the golf. I don't know, whatever you loved. These things start to change. Hey, can you like let me know or let my parents know or like what is the procedure Mm -hmm. to make sure that we get help? I love this. I I want to stay on just for one more second. I want to ask you about the pineal gland because mm-hmm. I am fascinated with it overall for a lot of reasons that aren't even just physical, but metaphysical even. Yeah. But, uh, and again, this is just me. I'm not an alarmist or anything like that. And I, and again, I, I, I just want to say this. I've had enough friends have young daughters that some of their acting out, whether, I'll give you, I'll, I'll just say it. Yeah. So they got on the pill. And prior to that, they weren't partying real hard. Mm. They weren't. They weren't. Yeah. They weren't doing what they were before. Now, as part of it, just it's the age and the pill correlated with that age, and that's a rebellious age. But or is there more self medicating going on? Is there, um, is there some you know more anxiety, angst, uh, wound up, whatever it is that I think you just really need to watch your young people and, and your young girls if they've been prescribed the pill to not yeah. just their behavior, not just their attitudes but some of their behaviors and watch a little bit more closely. I just had a daughter get out of those adolescent years and now she's a sophomore in college. And so I had a lot of young girls running around my house for a long time. And it's just interesting that during those years, mm-hmm. when this stuff starts with some of them, some of the other stuff started as well. Now you might say, take the pill out of the equation. Guess what, dummy? That's when kids start getting into alcohol and drinking. I get all that, but I also, it's it has been fascinating to me in conversations with friends of mine how correlated some of those behavior changes were yeah so i want to make sure that it's just we need to make sure that we're we're you know doing everything we can for the young ladies in our lives well to that point there are so many confounding variables right Mm -hmm. this is why we can't say the pill causes depression because there's so much going on we can say there's a correlation Mm -hmm. and what we do understand There has been some research showing that we are more prone to engage in risk-taking behavior Mm. when we're on the pill. That some of us can have basically a blunted cortisol response in the brain. In the way that PD, like people with PTSD, like came back from war, can mm. so that you don't respond in the same way. Mm. Uh, there's a PhD researcher, Dr. Sarah Hill. She wrote a book called "This Is Your Brain on Birth Control." And it is all about just the brain aspect. It was crazy. Her and I were writing our books at the same time. And uh, mine came out at the beginning of 2019. Hers came out at the end of 2019. But when we got copies and read each other, we were like, we were finding the same stuff, like in the research and coming to the same conclusions. But mm-hmm. yeah, she talks a lot too about how she came off the pill and she felt like, you know, she didn't know who she was on the pill. Like she was a different person off of it. There's a lot of women who say that, and there's a lot of doctors who are like, no, that's just not true. That doesn't affect you. Mm. Well, how do we know unless we listen to women who tell their stories? Mm -hmm. We can't just always look at only the research and expect that, like, that's going to give us every bit of information. It's almost like clinical experience has gone out the window and listening to your patients is like, just you know this thing that we don't do because either they fit into the box or they're wrong yeah well the other thing too is like attitudes and emotions are a very difficult thing to monitor and understand in any kind of data or any kind of study it's just difficult to know that it's not something we just take a lab test for and we have data for yeah but what i've just heard this enough that Mm -hmm. you're the first person to ever talk about it that i'm familiar with by the way i'm just really grateful that today's so good and so (laughs) different and that you flew from Mexico to do it. But before you go, we should talk about glands a little bit too. Mm-hmm. So I, I mentioned earlier the pineal gland. So what should we know about that? The pineal gland has something to do with like melatonin yeah. and your circadian rhythm and what yeah. else? And why does it matter? So we talked, you guys got to go rewind it, go back. Uh, we talked about cortisol mm-hmm. rising and I said expose yourself to light. Mm-hmm. So that light is going to pass through your eyes. It's going to affect the pineal gland. That's going to help. We're going to degrade and break down melatonin, and we're going to say it's time for cortisol to come up. Mm -hmm. In the evening, it's opposite. You need melatonin to rise for cortisol to come down. So if you are struggling with your adrenals, you have to sleep in a completely dark room. 
Get the temperature down. Uh, and, and that means sometimes you have to get an eye mask. But the other thing is that, you know, people are always like, avoid your electronics before bed. Okay. That would be great. I have enough people with ADHD that are like, I have to scroll until my brain shuts up and numbs out and I fall asleep. Amber glasses, blue light blocking glasses, okay. put on, you know, get an app or change your screen so that it's filtering that blue light because good. that blue light is going to break down your melatonin. Now, okay. In the book, I have a whole diagram about how sleep disruption affects all of our hormones, putting us at risk of infertility, inflammation, diabetes, I mean, the whole work. So okay. people often are like, oh, well, just if I'm skipping sleep, right? Quality restorative sleep matters as well. And why, you know, there's a lot that happens during sleep, but when we talk about the hormone melatonin, it's an antioxidant. So it's protecting us against free radicals. And it's not just protecting our brain, but in women, it's also protecting our ovaries. It's protecting our hormone producing centers as well. Mm. And so that's why you know, we want to have a good bedtime routine. I think it's um, it is one of those blessings of being a parent is that you do get into a routine. I feel like in your 20s, you're just like, I'm invisible. I'll never sleep. Right. I'll be fine. Like I seriously was like, I'll stay up till midnight studying in med school and then like get up at 5 a.m. and teach a weightlifting class and like do all of this stuff. And like now my 40 year old self is like, you should slap. <laughs> you really is it slept. sad that one of my favorite times every single day? is when I go to sleep. <laughs> no. I love sleep. I love sleep. I love that. I'm, a lot of you are nodding right now, but you get into the bed and you're like, oh gosh. Like when I was young, I didn't give a crap about sleep. Yeah. Now I'm like, I can't wait to do this. I don't know what that says about my in the middle of the day awake life, but I can't wait for sleep. Well, I think it's like part of it too is that you intuitively know, like this is when your brain detoxes. This is when the cleanup yeah. happens. You have really essential hormones that are rising. So around 10 p.m., we're going to see like growth hormone rises. And yeah. so you have to be asleep to be getting the benefit of all of these hormones and the whole mechanisms that I, I they consolidate that, memory. I think that's true. I also think like it's the time of day where I'm guaranteed to be disconnected. I'm not texting or emailing or yeah. having to talk to anybody during that time. Okay. If you stuck around to the end, I get to ask one of the most important questions at the end. Because you talk a lot about this and a lot about it lately too. So the last thing I want to ask you about is our thyroids. Mm. Because it's like a lot lately I hear you talking about this and the book. But this is something that it's kind of like these, ah, it's, they got a thyroid issue. Like the only time yeah. you ever hear is if someone's gained a significant amount of weight and they go, oh, it's the thyroid thing. But yeah. this is really critical. And I get my levels monitored and I'm on some medication for it myself. But talk twinning. about the. But, <laughs> I said twinning, twinning. Me too. Okay, good. Good, 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 good. So talk about the thyroid. Let's just let's yeah. address that before we go. It's important. It is super yeah. important. And I've been talking about it for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a butterfly shaped gland. It sits at the front of your neck. And. And the thyroid is going to affect every single system in your body. So thyroid hormone, specifically T3, which is the active thyroid hormone, there's a receptor in every cell in your body for it. Okay. That's how crucial it is. And that is why it's sometimes hard to get diagnosed because maybe you're presenting with brain fog. Maybe it's constipation, dry skin, hair loss, lateral third of your eyebrows is starting to disappear. Or maybe it's subtle, like you have heartburn and joint pain and your voice is kind of gravelly and deepening. These can be signs that your thyroid is too low. So mm. it's not always just energy alone. It's not just being cold and it's not just the weight gain. It's literally any cell in your body means any system in your body can start to present. So the most common we see is hypothyroidism. And within the United States, the most common reason is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Mm -hmm. That's an autoimmune condition. Okay. You literally kick your own ass. So your yes. immune system, uh, what, so I'm going to talk about Graves. So everybody in Hashimoto's, the antibodies dock onto the receptor. They flag the tissue for destruction. The immune system comes in and destroys it. In Graves' disease, which is much more rare, that's excess thyroid hormone. Everything's amped up, but you still feel tired sometimes, but you're anxious. You're finding that, um, you know, you have maybe diarrhea. You're sweating a lot. You're shaking. With that, it's an autoimmune condition where the thyroid is actually antibodies docking to it that stimulate it to produce thyroid hormone. Mm. So the, we've got these two autoimmune conditions in a perfect system. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't want to think we're imperfect just because we need thyroid meds, but right. in a perfect world, 
your brain, the pituitary signals TSH, that signals the thyroid. So when your doctor just measures TSH, they're just measuring the brain hormone, which is an indirect measurement of the actual hormones that the thyroid produces. It's useful, but it's not enough information. What should they measure? They want, you want to measure TSH, yeah. free T4, that's what the thyroid produces, mm. free T3, that is the conversion that needs to happen. Okay primarily in peripheral tissues like the gut and the kidneys, and then looking at those antibodies. If you've never had a TPO and thyroid globulin antibody, it's really important to have those screened because the antibodies come first when it comes to hypothyroidism, and then the thyroid disease where you need medication, that comes second. Mm -hmm. So this is what we most commonly see in the United States. People often are like, oh, just give iodine because your thyroid needs it. In developing nations, maybe that would be the solution, but I caution people with Hashimoto's because the research has shown us when there is a deficiency in selenium and we bring in thyroid, it can actually cause an autoimmune flare and you can feel a lot worse. And while we just talked about all the thyroid symptoms, it's important to understand that even with thyroid medication coming in, you may not still feel good yeah. because if the autoimmune condition is still progressing, we have to address that. You're in a highly inflamed state and mm -hmm. your body knows that it's time to slow down and to really just get you to simmer down and go to bed mm -hmm. so that you can heal. So mm -hmm. we want to do thorough testing, make sure that we understand what's going on. And then, as you were saying, sometimes hormone replacement therapy is necessary. Mm -hmm. You can live without estrogen testosterone, progesterone in menopause. So you can go through menopause. You can live without those. You can never live without thyroid hormone. It's mm. absolutely essential. Mm. And that's important for people to understand because, you know, my website, drbrighton.com, I have a ton of information about best diets to be eating to, mm -hmm. for thyroid, which, by the way, so everyone knows my jam is to fill you with nutrient-dense foods, not take everything away <laughs> kind yeah. of approach. I'm like, what can we eat to maximize our thyroid health, our adrenal health, our uh, immune health altogether? So looking at that piece, we want to be working on the nutrition aspect. But if enough tissue has been destroyed, you can't out eat your way out of it. It's kind of like, you know, in menopause, how if your ovaries stop, I cannot help you eat anything or exercise or do anything to make them make hormones again. If you lack thyroid gland, you're going to have to have thyroid hormone replacement. Gosh, I was just sitting here listening to you thinking in my own life how important um, – we talked about genders earlier. Think about how important the female doctors in my life are. <laughs> so, and, and I, what I reason I wanted you here today is I want the world to have access to you as at least their virtual mentor and doctor. And I wanted to put you on display to say, listen to this woman's brilliance. And <laughs> and and you all heard it here today. Like my my heart doctor is Dr. Amy Donine. My I guess longevity and wellness doctor is Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. And now I know Gabrielle. I know you That's do. That's awesome. And now my my go to and everything here is you. And so I um really enjoyed today. Like I'll be honest with you, they're flashing the time up on the screen. And I'm like, I thought we were like 25 minutes in, <laughs> and we're an hour in. It's you're you're such a treasure of information, and you're such a light in the world. You do something that everybody that I love that's an expert at what they do does well. Let me tell you what it is. They take incredibly complicated things, and they're so intelligent that they can break it down into simple, easy-to-understand terminology so that people that aren't experts in that field can take advantage of their wisdom and their knowledge. You do that. That's why I wanted you, by definition. You do that better than anybody that I know. Oh, thank you. Well, it is. It's rare. You're Every room you walk into, you're the smartest person in the room. But oh, I don't know about that. But... I do. <laughs> and, and, but, but unlike most people who are that way, you feel no need to prove it because you're really there to serve and to help and to heal people. And I just want to acknowledge you for that. I think you're remarkable. Oh, well, I, thank you so much. I truly I do. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Like, you are definitely trying to get me to come back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, you're coming back. We're gonna, you're, I got to feel like there's another book here soon. So I hope that I hope that you definitely come back. So, guys, if you have not done it yet, you can go get Is This Normal? Judgment-free, straight talk about your body. You can follow Dr. Brighton anywhere on social media. You can go to drbrighton.com. You can follow me on social media at edmylet.com. You can get my book, The Power of One More. Go get them together. 
right? If you're going to get her book, The Power of One More Book is my book. Get one more book. Oh, yeah. Besties. Besties. (laughs) Get them on your shelf. I loved this today. Thank you for traveling so far. Yeah, thanks for having me. Totally worth it. Millions of people just got healthier right now today. All right, guys. God bless you. Please share the show. Max out your life. And remember, you were born to do something great with your life. Take care. Take care.